Welcome to Digital Ship VPO webinar. Today, we'll explore how you can improve the quality of your vessel performance data. It's the subject that we haven't covered in our webinars yet, and we invited Green's team to share their experience improving data quality for some of their clients. Let me introduce you to our speakers, Jonas Fredriksen, Head of Performance Management, Matthew Streeter, Head of Product Management, together with Hannah Cooks, Marketing Manager, who will be moderating the discussion today. The webinar is sponsored by Green Street, Green's team. Please use your chance to ask them questions, sending them to Q&A box. Now we are starting the webinar with a short introduction from the moderator, Hannah Cooks. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Vader. And um, welcome everyone again to our Green Steam webinar. We decided to run this webinar today because data quality is now one of the biggest challenges for um, shipping companies as they work to improve vessel performance, unlock operational efficiencies, and ultimately reduce fuel wastage and emissions. Today, you'll see a presentation that explores industry challenges around data collection, data cleansing, and data reporting. Green Steam have been tackling these challenges for 14 years and uh, we're working with some of the leading shipping companies in the world. So whilst we can't share with you specific vessel names and customers, we still have plenty of insight that we can share with you today. So we're joined with two uh, speakers that Vader's introduced to you, our um, Jonas Fredriksen, our Head of Performance Management, and Matthew Streeter, Head of Product Management. Uh, they're both based in Copenhagen. Jonas is a past Head of Future Products with OMT and Matthew is a former product manager with BMT Smart. Uh, together they bring a wealth of experience in marine engineering, shipping science and maritime technology. We'll hear the 20 minute presentation from Jonas first and then Matthew will join him for the Q&A session at the end. As Vader said, we'd love to have all your questions. So please throughout the presentation, drop them into the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll pick them all up collectively at the end. Uh, so I think that's, that brings me to the end of my section and I will hand over to Jonas to start his section. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Baida. All right. So change the screen, right? Okay. So in uh, today's webinar, I will be covering first an introduction to Green Steam uh, and today's topic. And then secondly, I will uh, start to explore um, different types of data sources that we use and that will cover noon reports, high frequency sensor data. I'll be covering some of the most common challenges that we face with uh, noon reports and high frequency sensor data and some of the solutions uh, that are available. So today's webinar is uh, all about data and uh, let's face it, uh, my machine learning engineers will, uh, colleagues will probably not like me for saying this, but uh, data quality is, a bit of a boring dry library kind of subject, right? Um, but as uh, Ben Benanke, the former chief uh, of the Federal Reserve, he once said that in many spheres of human endeavor from science to business, to education, to economic policy, good decisions depend on good measurement. So at Green Steam, we live to this sentiment. And in fact, spending one hour today discussing data quality on ship data. It's nothing but the tip of the iceberg, really. But all right, let me start with introducing Greenstein. So Mother Nature, this is what we're all about. Taking good care of Mother Nature by eliminating waste from shipping and reducing harmful emissions. We create products that helps charters operators, owners to reduce their costs and their environmental footprint. And we strive to do that in a way where we make the everyday decisions easy. But the challenge is we live in such an extremely complex world that's both difficult to measure and difficult to predict. So looking at the earth, to just look at the cloud formations, cloud formations for instance, and you, you kind of understand that, right? So in order to achieve our goal uh, and, and to reduce shipping emissions, we have to make accurate predictions in this complex environment. So the question really is, 
how do we do that? And what does it take to do it? Everything starts with data quality. We have the best models in the world, but we can only achieve as much as the data quality allows us. You can argue actually that we as a company basically live and die on our prediction accuracy and our customers, they ask us to show them how we understand the performance of the vessels in any condition of the vessel and in any sea state, both in past, in the present and in the future. So we achieve the high prediction accuracy by focusing on three core elements. So the first one, well, data quality. Second one is data cleaning. By cleaning data, essentially removing bad data uh, that confuses our models. And finally, with high model quality. So we are constantly improving our advanced AI models. So these three core elements, they give us, uh, or is a prerequisite of high prediction accuracy. So that's our focus. But how do we do it specifically at Greenstein? We learn from the past to predict the future, you can say. Um, we do that in our uh, AI platform. So we ingest data into the platform. We are what we call data agnostic, meaning that we can take any known report, any high frequency sensor uh, data from any provider. And we combine that with mid ocean data and with the AIS data, satellite data, um, and add that to the platform. The platform then turns this data into models that we use for analytics and insights uh, of past performance and for predicting future performance. Right, so let's take a deeper look into uh, what it actually takes um, to achieve high prediction accuracy. So there are three steps to unlocking uh, your optimization goals. The first and most important is that you need to be able to understand past performance in any condition and in any sea state of the vessel. I'll be saying that a lot, but it's, an, it's super important. And the only way to go to step number two is by building an accurate model of the vessel. So when you have that, you can get insights into the past performance to optimize the future performance. An example of that could be, for instance, finding the optimum time to clean the vessel um, if you have falling on the vessel. And finally, we can use all that knowledge about the vessels, <clears throat> sorry, uh, by the past of the vessel uh, to predict the future performance, for instance, to reduce uh, voyage emissions. Okay, enough about uh, green steam. Uh, uh, let's turn the attention to data. So understanding data quality is absolute key to achieving the optimization goals that you have. And without good data quality, you risk acting on false advice. And that's especially true when considering that complex environment a vessel operates in, as we saw on the earlier slide. The number of parameters that we use uh, in our models, that actually depends on the purpose and the model. So we use up to around 25 uh, input parameters, depending also on the vessel, uh, what's available from the vessel, the model that we use for that specific application in the end. The most important parameters we use in the models are speed, draft to get the displacement, the power, the fuel consumption, and the wind and the wave. The question is, what do you need to do to understand the data quality to actually achieve the high prediction accuracy? So the most used data uh, source for performance optimization is still the noon report. Approximately 70 odd percent of the vessels on our platform use noon reports. Um, and despite all its challenges, noon reports can actually and is a source for understanding your vessel performance, but only if you know how to handle its deficiencies. So that begs the questions. What are these deficiencies? And what are the most common challenges we face uh, when we are using new reports for performance optimization? But before we dive deeper into that, uh, I think Vida have a little uh, poll for you.
Yes, everyone. So our question is, what is your biggest concern regarding your current known reported data? You can choose from three answers, accidental data mistakes, missing data entries, or deliberate data mistakes. We'll give you just a couple of seconds for everyone to vote. Okay, I think we have the result already. I'm sharing it with you. Yeah, so 52% of you answered that accidental data mistakes is your biggest concern. 47% of you indicate missing data entries and 32% of us today said that deliberate data mistakes is the biggest concern. Okay, thank you, Vida. Well, that's actually, uh, I think that's interesting. And it's also a, uh, I think uh, you will recognize that, uh, we recognize that, uh, you'll also see that uh, uh, in the coming slides. Um, so it's closed. All right, so let me continue here. So, um, below is a long list of challenges that we have with Noom reports uh, for performance optimization. And it ranges from Noom reports being in its nature, low frequency data. Uh, and whereas good models, they need a lot of data. Um, then you see, well, uh, essential data is often missing. You have uh, imprecise measurement equipment on board, making it difficult to get accurate readings on board the vessel. You have the conundrum, let's say, that uh, the owner operator is solely responsible for the data capture on board the vessel, uh, putting the charterer in a difficult situation for, 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 the, for performance optimization. And then there is also the issue of, of we often see that, you know, managing fuel reporting, uh, uh, fuel reporting is being managed on, on the entire voyage, uh, well, basically to meet contractual requirements rather than reporting the true vessel's performance each day. Uh, and that's, you know, closely related to, uh, you know, incorrect fuel reporting in bad weather, for instance. Um, this is all, I think, very common and known uh, in the industry, but um, there's also another item which is very important and not something that we see directly in the data uh, that can be measured uh, as such, but we can see patterns of it. And that is that, if you don't have an organizational focus on, let's say, on quality as a whole and quality of the Noom report or the value that it can bring um, to, to, let's say, to the goals that you, you might have, that's also a challenge. Um, and then finally, there's a wrath uh, of, uh, of, of challenges related to reporting itself, which I'll be focusing on uh, today um, on board the vessel. And that goes uh, from uh, innocent, we call it fuel reporting mistakes, to uh, it being difficult to, to actually measure uh, an exact daily consumption. Then there is an issue with uh, when is the data actually captured versus when is it reported, that which can create a bias in the model. Um, often we see reported uh, auxiliary consumption as uh, main engine consumption, vice versa. We have in inconsistent draft entries and even typos, right? So when doing trials with new customers, we actually find uh, sometimes that we have to remove as much as 30% due to about these above challenges. Um, and the first step to improve the quality of the new report is to improve the reporting itself. It's obvious, but that's what I'm focusing on now. So the question is, what is important to focus on when reporting? So we recently analyzed a large number of known reporting vessels in our platform, and we found uh, five reporting challenges that all affect the prediction accuracy. So this is trends we've seen in the data. On the left, you see the five uh, uh, challenges listed and, and, and how often they appear. 
So the first challenge we call grouped, and it appears in more than 70% of the cases that we analyzed. Um, group means that we have data that's grouped tightly together, maybe often with little correlation between the speed and the weather and the fuel. Um, it can, there can be various reasons, but it can be over-reporting, under-reporting, fuel fraud, difficult to measure. There can be many, many, uh, let's say, explanations to these five challenges, but this is patterns that we see in data. So the second um, challenge we call scattered. Basically, it's where data is all over the place and we don't necessarily see any clear relation or correlation between the speed and the power and the weather or the fuel. The third one is flat, not seen as much as a problem, but it's where uh, we have completely flat or constant consumption reported and with a little correlation uh, between the speed and the weather. The fourth is varied. So varied means that you have different reporting schemes, ways of reporting between different conditions of the vessel and diff or different periods of the vessel. The fifth and final, we call confused. So confused is when we have many outliers and maybe there's been an ex exchange of auxiliary and main engine consumption. So this is all good, but how does it actually look? So, so I found a couple of examples uh, of each of these so we can take a deeper look how it looks and, and maybe that will give you an idea of the problems associated with it. So the first one is grouped. So what you see here, is a speed fuel plot. So we have speed to water on, on, on the x-axis and the daily consumption on the y-axis. And the data points, each data point is a noon report. And these are colored according to the average sea state for that day based on hindcast data. So on this plot, is, we see um, sea states to up to around seven, eight, before seven, eight. So it's quite bad weather actually. And all the data points here, they are grouped quite closely together, which can be okay. If we see a clear tendency of increasing consumption or decreasing speed with increasing wave heights and so on. But in this specific example, we don't see these types of tendencies, let's say, or patterns. Uh, and we even see some quite large uh, outliers. Um, the second challenge is scattered. So for this specific vessel, quite to see data is, is kind of all over the place and, and it's very flat. So, you know, if you should draw a, a, a curve through these points, you will get a, 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 an, an odd uh, curve, I would say. Um, and you don't see much uh, difference between the sea states here either. Um, so the point of this is it's immediately, you know, it's not immediately easy or it's difficult to immediately know which data points are valid or which are bad based on this, All right? Let's go to the next one. The third one is, is, is what we call flat, where we have constant reporting or the crew is uh, instructed, which is clearly the case here uh, to, that the crew is instructed to follow a fixed consumption, which again in itself is not a problem. Um, but um, in this specific case, um, it's kind of bad, right? Because, you know, not it's not necessarily immediately obvious which of the data points are good or bad. Uh, but, and we do see a pattern here where you have some decreasing speed with increasing C state, but then there are data points very close with good weather and even lower speeds um, at the same consumption. So again, you know, something might appear here to be obviously wrong, but it's not immediately easy to see which of the data points are good, which are bad, um, uh, and, and even further, how to use that for, uh, um, yeah, for, for predictions, basically. I'll go to the fourth one, which is what we call varied. So the fourth challenge here is where we see completely different types of reporting between different conditions. And you might actually ask yourself, why is this a challenge? Because it may not affect the model greatly, but, and it's very important actually, that because it points, when you have such uh, scenarios here, it points toward a very deliberate reporting scheme by the crew 
that most likely leads to a bias in the model. And thus, well, it means a reduced prediction accuracy, what, which is what we want in the end. So in this specific example, same vessel, same uh, within six months. So it's the same period. You see 12 meter and on the left and 13 meter on the right. So very similar latent conditions. On the left, 12 meters, see very scattered, mm, not any clear pattern between the data and all the data is actually below both of five. Both of five. Right. On the second plot on the right, there was a draft change of one meter and a significant change in the reporting style. And if you pay attention to the color bar, you can see that the C states are actually changed quite dramatically here. Um, so what does that mean? Well, if you look at the, at the fuel consumption, it actually drops compared to at 12 meters. So something is clearly wrong here. There is an issue with this vessel and that it will most definitely affect the model accuracy for this vessel. Right, the fifth and final, we call confused. And basically it covers when we see reporting with big obvious outliers and cases, as I mentioned earlier, where we see uh, a mix or exchange between auxiliary and main engine consumption. Uh, and actually, I think it's worth mentioning that this report here was actually collected using a digital uh, new reporting app, so which actually should have stopped this random reporting from happening. But if the app doesn't have any cross validation checks, it can still happen. Um, Right, so that's five examples um, and, and of, of different challenges related to the Noom reports. So of course, the interesting question you might ask yourself, well, what do you do about it? What can be done about it? So in general, we advise and employ three measures to solve these Noom reporting challenges. The first one is an organizational focus um, on the importance of data quality. So there are several ways to do that. But of course, one very good starting point is to structure your Noom reporting with an app, preferably one that uses cross validation checks, as I mentioned before. Um, and that could be a platform like ours, a Liberty Noom reporting platform. The second measure is data cleansing. Advanced cleaning of the data is just super important to remove as many as, uh, of these reporting challenges as possible. So we have at Greensteam simple filters that checks, for instance, if a uh, parameter is within a given range. But then we also have a super advanced ransack uh, model that through an iterative uh, process identifies um, if there are any outliers in the data set. And, and we you actually use that as a, as a final step to clean the data in the, the data cleaning process before we train our models so that the model only sees the good data. Final measure, uh, which we propose, and I would say the optimum solution is our product, uh, Greensteam Capture, which is an app that scans uh, any meter engaged uh, on board the vessels using optical character recognition. And we've proven with this uh, device uh, 0.2% accuracy con compared to a fuel flow meter. Um, and the good thing about it is that you can integrate it with your own known reporting app uh, or ours, and or you can get it um, and you can get the data directly into our platform to, to start uh, getting advice and predictions. Basically. So that's three measures to solve these uh, known reporting challenges. And, I'd like to show you an example of how important data cleaning is of NUM report data. So in one case, we analyzed four bulk areas, three were NUM reporting and one were high frequency sensor data. We ran our models first on the unfiltered data, which is what you see in the amber column. Then again, we cleaned the data using our processes. That's what you see in yellow. Uh, and we compared uh, uh, that with the high frequency sensor vessel as a reference. Um, but how did we measure? How did we measure 
what is a good what's good data what's a good uh, model what's a good model quality basically so there are several ways to do that um the strict strictest measure uh, that we can employ uh, is the average prediction error every 10 minutes where we expose the model to as much variance as possible another measure we use um i haven't which i haven't included here but i'll show you that later is uh, the uh, error on a per voyage basis where we you where we see in general much lower errors, of course. So turning the attention to, to, to the diagram. So it's clearly seen that we can reduce these errors by actually quite a lot margin by cleaning data. But if you look at the Suez marks here, sometimes it's not possible. And perhaps that's because there's too much bias in the data. Uh, for the advanced uh, uh, cleaning model to flag the good data and the, from the bad data. Um, so it's not solving everything for you, but it goes a long way. And there's another important point when you look at this plot, and that is that it, well, data cleaning, it really significantly improves the quality of the model, but it's still no match for sensor data. And about sensor data, enough about Noom reports for now. So let's um, talk about that. Because with sensor data, high frequency sensor data, don't have any data quality problems, right? Well, you might have guessed that's unfortunately not the case. There are still multiple challenges associated with high frequency sensor data. But before we explore what those challenges are, let's have another poll. So Vida, could you please put up the poll? Yes. So our question to you is, what percentage of your fleet do you collect high frequency sensor data from? Less than 25%, between 25 and 50%, or more than 50%? We're curious what your experience is. We'll give you another 10 seconds to pick your choice. OK, I think we have the result. So the majority of all our audience today says that they collect um, from less than 25% from their fleet. 22% indicates 25 and 50% of their fleet, and more than 50%, um, only our 27% of audience is saying. Jonas, what do you think about uh, such a result? Yeah, but that's, it, go, it goes in line with what we have in our platform. So I think that makes uh, perfect sense. Um, so of course, we see a general trend in the market to, to more and more high frequency data with many more providers coming into the space. So, so but it, we still have the Noom report. Uh, we cannot, uh, uh, yeah, we, we still we have to use that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, sorry. I think we have another poll. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. let's do it. Um, so the next question is, which, which of these sensor types has been most difficult in reliability and accuracy for you? And the options, draft pre pressure sensor, speed log, fuel flow meter, or torque meter. Okay, I see that people are still voting. So let's wait about a couple of seconds. Okay, here we go. We have the result. So draft pressure sensor and speed lock were identified um, as the biggest reliability and accuracy problem by our audience. And fuel flow meter and torque meter um, as the second choice. So here you go. Have a look at the results. 
yeah that's uh, that uh, that rings a bell let's say and and uh and uh, you'll see more of that uh in a while in a little bit um all right but uh, thank you Vida. okay so what you see here is a list of some of the most common common sorry challenges that we face in our daily monitoring because we monitor uh, data from our vessels daily. That is sensors drifting over time, inaccurate speed logs, pressure sensors uh, that are maybe not even calibrated. We see fuel flow meters that are stuck, uh, torque meters that are not working. Um, and then we often actually see problems with the data transfer uh, to the cloud because subsystems fail that we rely on. Um, but then there's also interference from crew. Um, we, we see sometimes the draft sensors switch off during at sea, or flow meters, they are by bypassed um, during change of fuel in echo zones or in port. Um, so these are the most common issues that we deal with every day in our support team. Um, the question is, how do we deal with them? in general with data quality problems on high frequency sensor data. So we employ the following modus operandi. So first of all, have to continuously monitor your data and calibrate sensors. And that is day in, day out, you just have to do it. There's no way uh, around it. Um, even though you have this, all these fancy systems, you have to monitor the data. Um, second thing is data fusion, what we call. Basically, it's about finding the best signal available uh, to use as input parameters. And I'll show you an example in a moment. And then finally, again, cannot stress this enough, cleaning your data. All right, so far so good. So with Noom reports, I showed you what can be achieved with the cleaning your data. And this time I'll show you uh, an example of the importance of carefully selecting which signals to use in your model. So in this specific uh, case, we had a vessel that had some sensor issues that required us to, well, carefully select the best data sources to put into the, to the model. So one of the problems is what we see here. That was the pressure sensor that we used to get the drafts uh, into our model. So on the diagram, you see that the draft from the pressure sensor is the blue curve, speed through water is the amber uh, curve, and then you have the uh, drafts from the noon reports in red. So what you immediately see here is that, well, draft from the pressure sensor is highly affected by the ship speed, which clearly is not realistic uh, for the draft to change um, several meters. So we had problems with this uh, model and we had too high errors. So we looked at, okay, what can we do? So we compared with the new report draft and we found that it was much better signal in this case. Um, and actually, if you look at the very end at January 20, you see that actually the two signals, they kind of converge when the speed through order goes to zero, which is where the draft pressure sensor works best uh, at, at the, well, at a zero speed basically. <clears throat> So that's one example of methodically, you have to look at each um, parameter data value uh, and which to put into your model because it has great effect. I have another example, same with. So another issue was you also said in the, in the, um, in the poll, um, speed log. Or actually this is an, is an interesting, um, interesting case here because often speed logs they are the ones that are mostly incorrect uh, so we actually per default estimate the speed through water using the speed over ground from the gps and combine that with the ocean and tidal currents from mid-ocean satellite data so we all, always compare what, what's the effect of these um, and if you look at the diagrams on the left you have the hour of derived speed through water and on the, on the right, you have the, the vessel's speed log. The blue curves are our predictions. 
and the uh, amber is the measured fuel consumption from the vessel. And you see clearly that actually the prediction error goes down. It's much more aligned with the actual fuel consumption in this specific case when using the speed lock. Right. So that's actually a, a, a case where, well, you cannot just rely on, on these uh, common thoughts or paradigms or mental uh, inertia uh, about the things. You actually have to carefully look into data uh, and how it affects uh, your models and the prediction accuracy. So, uh, and about that, how does it actually affect uh, the prediction accuracy with these uh, uh, sensor changes, let's say. So what I've done here is I've compared the two scenarios and added a very well-equipped ferry for reference. So again, I've compared the uh, average prediction error every 10 minutes, like I did before, that's in blue and also the voyage average voyage prediction error in amber here. So on the, on the left, you have the case where we use the pressure sensor and the derived speed of water. And in the middle, you have where we use the noon report draft and the speed log. And then of course we have the ferry at the, at the right end. And, and it's clearly seen, first of all, well, it makes sense. We improve the accuracy from 12 point something to eight, uh, seven point something percent. So that's a significant improvement in the prediction accuracy for this specific vessel by carefully selecting the uh, right uh, input signal parameter. You also see that it's actually possible to get very low uh, voyage prediction errors. Um, and um, regarding voyage prediction errors, I have a final example um, before we end. Um, where I try to visualize what it makes, what difference it makes having an accurate model, let's say. Because we've seen how we can improve the prediction accuracy using known reports and high frequency sensor data. But what does it all matter in the end? Because, you know, it can lead to wrong decisions, uh, well, being made, if you don't have a vessel model that's accurate in all conditions, uh, be all drafts, operational conditions, and all sea states of the vessel. So the final example I'll show is just to see, show you how important accuracy of the model, high prediction accuracy, how important that is. So one of our customers had a voyage from Australia to China, and a routing provider estimated the consumption using a standard model of the vessel, not driven by data. They predicted before the voyage 501 ton, whereas we predicted 595 tons for the voyage. So there was a big discrepancy here. But after the voyage, we found that the vessel actually consumed 604 tons. So we were actually within 2%, uh, whereas the routing provider was off by 17%. Right. So basically, saying that you know standard models that are not driven by data or models that are not insufficiently clean they can lead to large errors having a big effect and potentially wrong decisions can be made which in the end results in fuel wastage increased emissions and kind of defeats the whole purpose of what we are trying to achieve and that leads me to the final slide uh, with three key takeaways I'd like you to take from today. And that is, first of all, high frequency sensor data and noon reports, they have several issues, challenges associated with them. But with continuous monitoring and cleaning of the data, you can actually achieve high prediction error, even though you have problems with the, with the data. And finally, Prediction accuracy is extremely important when you make decisions. And that was the final word from me and I'll hand it back to Hannah because now I believe we'll have a option for Q&A. Uh, 
maybe I will. Thank you, Jonas. Um, fantastic, really interesting presentation. I certainly enjoyed it. I hope our audience did. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, we'll just give people a few more minutes just to have a think if they've got um, any questions they'd like to add. It's just on the bottom right hand corner Q&A. So if you can just drop in your questions now and we'll work through them. And also, so I'll take this opportunity, Matthew, if you want to join us um, for these questions. Um, so we'll just, we've only got a couple in here at the moment. So they're starting to come in now. Let's give people a minute longer. A couple of people have asked about um, having a copy of the presentation. So this has been recorded and Digital Ship do share it. They'll email, email it out to you um, within the next 24 hours and the recording will be hosted on YouTube. Um, but any questions also that you want to ask us privately, um, just tick that you're happy for us to get in contact with you um, and um, we will be in touch the team straight away with either Jonas or Matthew can, can talk to you directly, privately, one-on-one -on -one if you want to. So we've had a couple of questions start coming in now. So uh, Robert's asked the first one, STW on charts, what about accuracy on this speed in sea states? Who is our, who would like to take that one first? Jonas and Matthew are both on mute, just to warn you. <laughs> So I can take that one. Um, yeah, we we don't tend to see a drop in accuracy from the the speed logs on board in the different sea states. Um, we may see some changes in the speed over ground measurements, um, especially when we're using AIS as the sea state starts to worsen off. But because when we're using noon reports, we're seeing that over the 24 hour average period, um, we don't see that sort of um, actually flowing through to the model and affecting the accuracy of the modeling. So um, we don't see a huge issue there. Thank you, Matthew. So the next one on this is uh, Nikos. Oh, let's just jump to that. Nikos, um, in case that the vessel during the 24 hours time traveled in different speeds, RPM, power, et cetera, the Green Scene app, what data will capture uh, for the above parameters? Yeah. Right, uh, yeah, I can answer that. <clears throat> so, um... I think uh, to answer that, uh, there are, I'll have to answer two questions basically because first one about the green steam or the capture app. So basically, you know, you can um, capture, let's say any meter um, on board the vessel. It's what you choose uh, to be important. Uh, and you can do that as many times as you want per day. So that means uh, the more you do it, the more higher frequency signal you get the more uh, higher prediction accuracy you can actually get as well. So that's one thing. But the other thing that we do with all new report data and also with capture data is that we do something we call virtual sensing. So, and that is basically converting the, if I talk about a new report, converting the 24 hour period um, report into 10 minute high frequency signal. Actually, our platform works in high frequency signals uh, only. Uh, but we do that by predicting the fuel or the power in each 10 minute window by combining uh, different uh, data sources. So we know, for instance, if it's a noon report vessel, we know the AIS track. And because we know that, we know also what for each point in time, we know what was the weather like here, what was the current the temperature of the sea, all these parameters that we use in the model. And then we, the model takes all that data and starts to predict. So that's how we um, basically handle that. Um, yeah. okay, thank you very much, Jonas. Um, so another next question is from Robert, um, discussing the model's importance for predictions. What kind of model do you apply, black box or at least gray box, considering the basic physics? And are we over to you, Matthew? Yeah, sure. Um, so we actually have different models uh, for different purposes, as um, Jonas mentioned during the presentation. So we, we do have a more black box style model when we're getting uh, high frequency data from um, some of our vessels where we trust the reliability of it. And, you know, we're, we're trying to look back historically at the performance of the vessel. However, we also have um, what we call a hybrid model. So a gray box model where 
we're using the hydrodynamic theory to actually feed into the model so that we can use this data to help with the noon reports when it's very low resolution and low frequency. Um, this is also the model that we're using when we're forecasting so that we can extrapolate outside of the data range safely um, and not allow the model to come up with um, unrealistic uh, performance predictions in different weather conditions it's never seen before. So we have a variety of different models for different purposes and different services. Wonderful, thank you, Matthew. Uh, next one, Anto, when you say to the customer, end user data needs to be clean, do they understand this or wonder what this is about? Jonas? Yeah, so I think they do because we take them through a, a process from, from, let's say from the very beginning when we onboard, you know, that we take on the vessels uh, being from, you know, typically, you know, we have, we get data from different sources for the same customer, depending on the vessels they have. We do this thorough process of, of mapping each of the, um, well, each of the vessels. Uh, and then we talk about this with the, with the customer. Um, and then of course, let's say the whole cleaning uh, of the data itself, that's something that happens automatically. Of course, we as naval architects, we have naval architects, data scientists that review the models and the outcomes if something is completely off. Um, but you know that's actually a, uh, an automated uh, process. So um, what we try to work with the customer to improve the data quality, you know, at the source as well. Um, so there are different ways to 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 do this. And Jonas, the next question probably follows straight on. How do you clean data? Yeah, so uh, that's that's a it's a it's a process in different steps, I'd say. So um, first, I also mentioned that uh, before that we have some simple filters. You know, simply checking if a parameter is in within a range that we would expect. You know, an obvious one is that you don't you don't see a for a cape, cape size you don't see one thousand tons per day but you would probably see 100 tons per day. That's a very simple one, I know, but that's, you know, need to sort out all the obvious ones first. And then after that, when everything is in the right format in the platform, all data sources have been combined, satellite, uh, ship data, all that, then a model in itself starts to clean the data. And that's an AI model that uh, it's called the ransack filter. We have different types, but, um, they kind of see patterns in the data and, and, and find and flags the, uh, basically the data points that are not within its range, let's say. So that's, that's a more thorough process because, and then the final step is we clean the data. Oh, sorry, we, we train the models with the cleaned data um, so that the model is, um, can basically predict uh, the right uh, consumption of power. Um, Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, and Nimal asks, um, what performance metrics um, are used to uh, calculate the current performance of the vessel? Matthew? I was gonna say, actually, it's probably another one for you, Jonas. Okay, Jonas. Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure what it means by current performance of the vessel, but basically I can say that um, in our models, we take a lot of different parameters uh, and that is from the vessels in like, speed, draft, power, fuel, um, whatever we can get, um, basically. And then we combine that with uh, mid-ocean data so that information about the, the wind, the waves, and the water itself, the currents, temperature, and so on. So that's basically combined into the model. Um, and then we have, let's say, to, let's say, um, um, I would say in AI, it's really good at, at tracking performance changes over time. So as such, we operate with what we call a dynamic baseline, meaning that the baseline of the vessel changes with more data. And data can also be, for instance, that we have a cleaning of the vessel or a dry dock. And then with all that additional information, we see what's the true performance level achievable from that specific vessel. We also use for our hybrid models, uh, we also have the ability to use uh, sea trials reports. So you can get an, let's say a current performance compared to a sea trial, even though we probably all know that a sea trial is not as uh, accurate as it could have been, but uh, it can 
you'd be used to get an idea at least. Um, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, well, we just have one jump up to the top. So it's had some extra votes. So a couple of you want this one answered. Some Victoria, updating the vessel with high frequency data is an investment. What is expected for return on investment for saving fuel, et cetera? So I think that that really depends on the services that you actually um, then take out of our platform. So um, we offer a range from fouling um, historic assessments to looking at uh, dry docking effectiveness and coatings, but also then we also have uh, forecasting services looking at speed optimizations over a future voyage. Now, I think if you start looking at um, the speed optimizations, the return on investment could actually shrink down to six months because we see on some voyages we can save between between three and six percent using the speed optimization, um, which on certain vessels actually can be a, a significant sum and that can shrink that return on investment. If you're looking at the historic kind of evaluation, then it starts to stretch out to a slightly longer period. And then, and then I think you're looking at more like nine to 12 months on your internal investment. Okay, great. And actually, uh, that, this question probably follows on quite nicely. Um, Sean's question, are you suggesting that even companies committed to high frequency data from sensors can use capture to mitigate the sensor failure and unreliability. Yeah, I think that's really important that um, we see a number of vessels, even when they make the investment into Coriolis mass flow meters and good quality torque meters, that there will inevitably be failures um, over the period um, of the vessel's life. And of course, logistics at the moment have been heavily restricted to actually get on, get spare parts on board and get these items fixed. So. Um, I think using capture is a great way to actually fill in the gap so that we can continue to provide services to um, for those vessels when those sensors have failed. Um, I mean, also hopefully because we can use main engine consumption and uh, the shaft power uh, measurements to run the models, hopefully they both don't fail at the same time. So we have some redundancy in the way that our modeling works that it can use both parameters when we're training um, the model. Maybe I can just add to that because uh, capture in the case that a, a vessel is equipped with high frequency center data, maybe you as, as a charterer, just, you don't have access to that data. So that's where capture also comes in uh, to place where for the charterer to use capture on that specific vessel um, to create uh, well transparency and uh, to get the data off the vessel um, that the right. charterer needs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've had a couple of more questions voted at the top. So I'll, I'll go with Tara. So how would you provide this data if the vessels don't have particular sensors, fuel sensors, or ECU connections? Can you still access it? I think that's really where um, Capture comes in, which is our mobile app. So, you know, if there's no connections on the vessel, but there is still a flow meter on board, um, then the, the app essentially goes along and uses optical character recognition to extract a reading from the flow meter. Um, and we have some crews that are actually taking measurements every six hours. Um, so that's how we're taking data off the vessels if they don't have any high frequency data collection systems on board. Um, then if there aren't any fuel flow, um, um, fuel flow meters installed on board, then we start to see if we can get any kind of engine power uh, measurements off the vessel and we start using that and we're, we're converting that into uh, through propeller efficiency and shaft losses to actually estimate the, um, the shaft power and that's then what we would use in the modeling. Lovely, thank you. Um, I'll go on to Kumar's one. So do you customize validations in your data capture forms for each vessel? Yeah, so the um, our noon reporting tool is called Green Steam Liberty, and that is fully customized to the vessel that uh, it's installed on board. So there are vessel specific um, data quality checks with upper and lower limits on almost every field that you fill in. There's also cross validation between the different fields that your your the crew are completing. So that is customized to the vessel, and, and then of course as the data flows through to the shoreside application, there are then vessel specific filters set up, and then the the modeling we do to actually look for outlier detection that's also vessel specific as well lovely thank you matthew um okay so back to the top uh, victoria what is the most important parameters to your model if we make the choice to update continuously the vessel what should be the first dev devices to digitalize yeah, so i think there are two questions in that question the first one is uh, the most important parameter is dead weight 
that's the most defining, let's say, parameter by, by all means uh, related to the performance of the vessel. But of course, you need more than that. Uh, so um, I think to answer that question, uh, because I think it's what you're going to digitalize. Um, so of course, you know, the most important is you, you need the speed, of course, but you need the, you know, and you need the fuel and the power and the draft. Um, that's that's really uh, what you need from the vessel. Um, just look at a noon report. What do we use from a noon report, which is the most, <clears throat> let's say, basic example? We use the 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 fuel every twenty four hours. Basically, that's it, right? And the drafts, of course. Um, so that's the most essential, at least. Thank you. Um, so Yoshin asked well, for those examples you showed for noon reports. Is there a timeline for these? Are they all captured within a short period of time or is there a significant period during which they were captured? Yeah, so all the examples I had was within six months and none of these had uh, big changes within the six months. For instance, there were no hull cleaning, there were no dry docks or anything. So this was just captured. And, and I, I took five vessels with different parameters. We, we, we have more than, uh, in that uh, analysis, more than 250 vessels. Um, and there are so many of these, so it's it's not just one off. I could, you know, find a needle in the haystack. It's it's so common, it's really so common. Um, yeah, I think also because we were looking at very specific drafts and load conditions in those examples, it's actually likely that they were over one or two voyages, because uh, I think the shortest period we were looking at for some of those vessels was less than two months. So, you know, we're seeing that spread over a single voyage in the data that's being recorded by the noon reports. And as Jonas said, the, the, uh, these vessels all have digital noon reporting tools on board that should be capturing some of these problems and restricting them. And um, they're, they're clearly not solving these problems. Okay, thank you both. Uh, our last question at the moment, how do you come up with the gray model? You um, will need the hull form and lines, propeller curve, et cetera. How do you get that? Yeah, we, I don't think we, we need that level of detail. Um, really, we start with very basic ship parameters. Um, we do request sea trials uh, for the vessel, but really we're looking at things like block coefficient um, and the vessel basic vessel parameters, and we feed that into the model. So we're not going to go to a, an owner and say that we need the full lines plan or the propeller curves because we know that's not realistic. So we design the model to work with uh, either freely available data or data that we know the owner will have uh, available and maybe some charters do as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so last chance for anyone to ask any more questions if they've got any they want to put forward. If not, then um, thank you both very much for that. And um, yeah, it's it's been a pleasure listening to all those questions and answers. And Vader, back over to you. Thank you. I hope we are having a better understanding now about the data accuracy. Thank you very much for Green's team, Jonas, Matthew and Hannah. An update about next week on Thursday, we'll present you another VPO subject that I will be discussing algorithms and automation for propulsion efficiency. Sign up if you haven't already, if that's an interest of you for you. Now Digital Ship is signing off until next week. Take care. Bye.